So in this chapter, we are now going to turn our attention to the campaign process in the United States. Campaigns occur all the time in this country. Candidates running for elective office have to run an efficient and effective campaign if they are going to win public office. One of the best well-known campaigns in this country occurs every four years when we have a presidential election and a presidential campaign. Presidential campaigns, as we will see in this chapter, leave indelible marks on the nation. The presidential campaign of 2016 is already leaving indelible marks on this country. In this chapter, we will examine the campaign process much more closely. In this chapter, we'll begin by taking a close look at presidential campaigns and how they are run. We start with a look at the primaries. Next, we'll look at the role of money in campaigns and determine why campaigns have a limited impact on election outcomes. Then we'll consider the voters, looking at why people vote or don't vote, and the factors that influence their voting behavior. Finally, we'll use the presidential campaign of 2012 to analyze the campaign process. We are not going to use the most recently completed presidential election campaign of 2016 because we are still too close to it to analyze it with certainty yet. We need to gain a little bit more perspective before we go and look at that. So let's begin by looking at the roots of modern political campaigns and where the modern political campaign has come from. That's our first objective. Campaigns are both unique and they are similar to each other. Well, how can that be? How can they be all unique from each other but similar to each other at the same time? Well, that's because the candidates, the issues, the technology, the scandals, and the results all change from campaign to campaign, making them all unique from each other. But the structure of a campaign generally remains the same from campaign to campaign, and we will see that and learn about that in this first section. Before a candidate can run in the general election, he or she must win his or her party's primary election. The primary campaign starts years before the general election, with potential candidates testing the waters, targeting party leaders and interest groups to see if they can build a base of support. Candidates also test out themes, slogans, and strategies at this time to see which ones may work with the voters and which ones may not work. Very few citizens vote in primary elections. It's actually a small group of people that choose to participate in a primary election, usually less than 20% of eligible voters. That means it gives this small group of voters great influence and power over determining who the nominees of the party will be. And the people that do choose to participate in primary elections tend to be very ideologically driven partisans, people that are very committed to their political parties and have a very strong interest in politics. And these people tend to differ from the average voter or the average citizen because they tend to be much more conservative than the average citizen on the Republican side and much more liberal than the average citizen on the Democratic side. And yet these are the people who are choosing the party nominees. Now, candidates who shift too far to the right or too far to the left to appeal to primary voters to win the primary election may often find themselves perceived as too extreme in the general election. So then when they win the primary nomination and they try to appear more moderate in the general election campaign, statements that they made in the primary campaign may come back to haunt them because they will be accused of flip-flopping on their positions from the primary election to the general election campaign. Once a candidate has won the primary nomination, they must switch gears and pivot to the general election. In the general election campaign, they are running against nominees from other parties. Most partisan voters are like, unlikely rather, to change their party loyalty. So the candidates in the general election are not really competing for all of the voters because most Democrats will vote for the Democratic candidate and most Republicans will vote for the Republican candidate. So in a campaign, candidates are really competing for the very few undecided voters in the middle of the political spectrum who could choose to vote for either party. The whole general election campaign is geared to wooing these undecided voters, 
not the partisan voters who have already made up their minds at the beginning of the campaign. The length of the general election campaign varies by state, depending on how early that state holds its primary election. So why are political campaigns important? Well, political campaigns help voters to make informed choices on election day. They do this through a complex set of political tools, including media signs and slogans and television commercials and mailings and social media and digital websites and things like that. Here, a sign encourages voters to endorse Dwight D. Eisenhower and Richard M. Nixon for president and vice president, respectively, back in 1952. The first thing that a candidate has to do when they declare for office is assemble a campaign staff, a group of people who will help run their campaign, because they can't do it all by themselves. Candidates may be the center of political campaigns, but much of the decision-making and work of the campaign is done by trusted advisors and campaign staff, and many times, increasingly, these campaign staff are paid, hired political professionals that do it for a living. In this section, we will learn about some of the major actors in political campaigns. The first and most obvious person in a political campaign is the candidate himself or herself. The candidate is the person that is running for political office, and the decision to run for political office is not an easy one. Candidates run for office for any number of reasons, including personal ambition, the desire to promote ideological objectives, or to pursue specific public policies, or simply because they think they can do a better job than their opponents. Regardless of their reasons for taking the plunge, a campaign for public office takes a massive personal toll on candidates and their families, who are subjected to intense public explo exposure and scrutiny. Since there is only one winner in each election, the candidate is also risking rejection by the voters. And this is why many people choose not to run for public office, because once you run, you're put in a public spotlight. Every part of your life is put under a microscope, and people investigate every part of your life and your background. And many candidates don't want to put themselves nor their families through that process. And they also don't feel like being rejected by the voters if they lose, because they take it personally. So running for office is not for everyone. It is impossible for candidates to meet more than a tiny fraction of the voters personally, but they must try. Glad-handing has symbolic value, and candidates maintain grueling schedules in their efforts to come face-to-face -face with as many voters as possible. It's a daunting and tiring task running for office. They must also engage in continual fundraising, constantly asking people for more and more money throughout the campaign to help fund their campaign. Sleep is a luxury when you're a candidate. You don't get to sleep very often. And sleep-deprived candidates become increasingly short-tempered. You know how you feel cranky when you haven't had a lot of sleep? Well, that's how candidates often feel. They haven't had much sleep, and they get cranky. They lose their temper. And as campaigns progress, this can lead to making gaffes, which could cost them the election. They say things that they don't mean and they wish they could take back, but once it's out there, it's too late. And that can cost them the election. So it is difficult to be a candidate for public office, especially running for the presidency. Then there is the campaign staff, the people who work for the campaign. Some of these are paid staff that are actually paid money and receive a salary for their work and they're paid professionals. And many people are volunteers people who don't get paid anything but want to help the candidate get elected and volunteer their time. Both paid staff and an army of volunteers work on political campaigns. You may be interested enough in politics someday to choose to work on a political campaign. Some of you may even choose to go into it as part of your professional careers. Obviously, the size of the staff varies depending upon the level of the campaign. Campaigns for higher office have bigger staffs and hire more people. Campaigns for lower levels of office have fewer people on their staff and more volunteers. Most state and national campaigns have a campaign manager, someone who, who is hired full-time to run the campaign on a day-to-day -day basis. The campaign manager is in charge of overseeing the entire campaign staff. The campaign manager works very closely with the candidate, 
traveling with him or her on a daily basis and making most of the day-to-day -day decisions related to campaign logistics and strategy of the campaign. The finance chairperson handles the financial and accounting aspects of the campaign. They spearhead fundraising and help the candidate to raise as much money as possible. They file required paperwork with the government, and they track income and expenditures. As campaigns have gotten more expensive, this role has become significantly more critical and prestigious, and usually most campaigns will hire a paid po professional political fundraiser to be their finance chairperson. The communications director also has a crucial role, and, uh, and two, is often a paid professional position. The communications director for a campaign develops the media strategy for the campaign, including supervision of all advertisements, both paid and earned. Well-funded campaigns will also hire someone called a press secretary who interacts with journalists on a daily basis and acts as a primary spokesperson for the campaign. This job includes responding to attacks on the campaign and delivering bad news. It is better not to have the actual candidate do the dirty work of the campaign. It is better left to the press secretary to do that. The internet plays an increasingly large role in political campaigns, and some staff are devoted just to maintaining the candidate's presence online, and many times there are paid professionals who are hired to direct the internet strategy of the campaign. Candidates rely on a variety of paid professional political consultants who do this kind of work for a living full time and increasingly have earned graduate and master's degrees in this kind of work and become very specialized in it. And particularly, they rely on paid pollsters to give them up to the minute information on where they stand with voters and to gauge the potential reaction to various positions and advertisements. Last but not least are unpaid volunteers. They are the lifeblood of political campaigns. Campaigns can't be run without an army of volunteers. Volunteers canvass. That means they go door to door soliciting money and votes. And they engage in get out the vote efforts, such as providing transportation to the polls, calling people and knocking on doors to get them out to vote on election day. So what role do campaign staff play? Staff assist the candidate with much of the day-to-day -day work of running a political campaign. Here, in 2012, presidential candidate Mitt Romney holds a campaign, or holds a meeting rather, on his campaign bus with senior advisors Stuart Stevens and Eric Fernstrom, and campaign manager Beth Myers. You can see that often the campaign staff will travel with the candidate. So, with so many people running a campaign, how is a campaign staff organized? Well, this diagram here gives you a picture of the typical organization of a campaign staff. By looking at President Barack Obama's campaign organization, which was called Obama for America, back in 2012. You can see the senior campaign staff, the people that had the top campaign positions, the campaign manager, the senior consultant, the senior advisors, the director of opinion research, and the deputy campaign managers were all at the top of the campaign staff and oversaw the rest of them. But then different jobs on the campaign staff were broken down based on their role in the campaign. Operations, finance, communications, internet and information technology, political staff, policy staff, research and polling staff, field operations staff, the staff for the vice presidential candidate, Joe Biden, and even staff for, the, for Michelle Obama, who ultimately became the first lady. Presidential candidates have very large staffs that help them run the day-to-day -day operations of their lengthy campaigns to be the chief executive of the United States. Among these officers are the campaign manager, the finance chair, the communications director, and a large number of paid professional political consultants. Modern political campaigns are staggeringly expensive. Tens of millions of dollars are often raised for Senate races and sometimes even House races, and hundreds of millions of dollars are raised for presidential campaigns. The Democratic and Republican parties raised over $2 billion 
for the 2012 presidential election campaign. Congress has made some half-hearted attempts to regulate campaign finance, but these efforts have been unsuccessful in curbing the growing role of money in political campaigns. In this section, we will briefly look at some of these campaign finance reform efforts and consider sources of campaign funding. Early attempts to regulate campaign finance included a prohibition on soliciting funds from federal workers. That was passed in 1883 along with other early civil service reforms that were part of the Pendleton Act and then the Tillman Act of 1907, which prohibited corporations from making direct contributions to candidates for federal office. But the first serious legislation came in the 1970s. In 1974, the Federal Election Campaign Act was passed, which created a program to provide public funding for presidential candidates. And the Federal Election Commission, the FEC, was created as a government agency to enforce federal election campaign finance laws. Another attempt at regulating campaign finance came in 2002. It was a bipartisan law that was passed by Senators John McCain and Russ Feingold and sponsored by them in the Senate, which became known as the Bi McCain-Feingold Law, although its official name was the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002, the BCRA. That law set new limits on contributions to campaigns and advertising. The details of these laws are provided in your readings, and it would be well worth your while to become familiar with the de details of campaign finance law, as they are often tested on the AP exam. Opponents quickly challenged the BCRA on free speech grounds, claiming that it limited the right to free speech guaranteed in the First Amendment. And, this, and that case was actually heard by the Supreme Court. In that case, McC uh, McConnell versus FEC the Supreme Court ruled that certain parts of the BCRA were unconstitutional, such as limits on when advocacy ads can run on TV, and those that limited the amount of money candidates could spend of their own money on their own campaign. Most significantly, the court's decision in a very important landmark case, Citizens United versus FEC in 2010, held that spending on a campaign is a form of free speech and thus cannot be legally restricted. This ruling gutted campaign finance reform and has led to the unchecked expansion of campaign spending since. After the decision in Citizens United versus FEC in 2010, it opened the floodgates of spending on campaigns, not only for the candidates, but also by outside groups that sought to elect one candidate or another. As you saw in the preceding table, individuals are limited to contributing no more than $2,500 per candidate per election. Primary and general elections are considered separately. Individual donors provide most campaign funding. In 2012, President Obama raised over $600 million for his re-election campaign, with 34% coming from small donors. Parties also give money to their nominees. They can contribute up to $5,000 for a House candidate and $43,100 to a Senate candidate. Parties provide about 20% of a candidate's campaign funds. Since the Supreme Court ruled that no limits could be placed on personal financing of campaigns, some wealthy candidates have spent tens of millions of dollars of their own money on their campaigns. Interestingly, these wealthy self-financed candidates rarely win. PACs, known as political action committees, are fundraising organizations created by economic or ideologically driven groups. PACs can give up to $5,000 per candidate per election. In 2012, PACs contributed $32 million, 61% of which went to Republican candidates and 39% of which went to Democrats. PACs are controversial because they are viewed as special interests buying politicians. The Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act places limits on how much individuals and committees can contribute per election and per year. That is shown in the table here, and it would be well worth your while to study this table and the limits that apply under the BCRA. So how do political action committees allocate their campaign contributions? 
Political action committees are major players in American elections. Most PAC money goes to incumbent candidates because they have the best chance of winning. But because most of the money goes to them, that gives them the best chance of winning. So it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But as you can see here, most PAC money goes to incumbent candidates running for both the House of Representatives and the Senate. Very little PAC money goes to challengers. And that's one of the things that makes it very difficult for a challenger to defeat an incumbent for re-election. This is one of the major advantages of incumbency. Five twenty seven groups are named for the section of the tax code, section five twenty seven, that covers them. Five twenty seven groups do not contribute directly to candidates, but they do conduct election act electioneering activities on behalf of their interests. In twenty twelve, five twenty seven groups spent three hundred and forty three million dollars on electoral activities. Another type of group called a five oh one C interest group named after that section of the tax code, they are not primarily political, and they are not allowed to spend more than half of their funds on campaign politics. Super PACs are the fastest growing actor in electoral politics. Super PACs are a special type of political action committee that spends money independently of individual campaigns. They do not give money directly to candidates, and they are not subject to expenditure limits. They can raise and spend as much money as they want to. In 2012, Super PACs spent over $600 million. Public campaign funds are donations from general tax revenues to candidates for public office. If a presidential candidate raises at least $5,000, he can apply for federal matching funds. Third-party candidates only get funds after the election if they earned more than 5% of the vote. These funds come from the Presidential Election Campaign Fund, which collects $3 each from the taxes of those who check the donation box on their tax return. Candidates who accept public funds must use them as the sole source of funding for their campaign. They are not allowed to raise any other money from any other source. The current cap, cap is $91.2 million per candidate. In 2008, Barack Obama became the first candidate to opt out of public financing because he found out he could raise far more than $91 million on his own. In 2012, both candidates, Barack Obama and Mitt Romney, opted out of, can of public funding, and so too in 2016, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton opted out of public funding as well. In both elections, each candidate was able to raise significantly more money on their own than the federal limit. So the trend of refusing public funding of campaigns is likely to continue. The media have almost complete control over what you, the voters, see and hear about political candidates. Both traditional and new social and digital media are important for campaign coverage today. Candidates have little control over how they are portrayed in the media except for the content of their own campaign advertisements. In this section, we will explore the roles of traditional media, new media, and campaign advertising. The news media report what they view as newsworthy, what it, they call fit to print, as they say. They report on candidates' speeches and other campaign activities, as well as any unflattering personal details that may emerge. Much to the annoyance of the candidates, the main focus of the media at election time tends to be on what we call the horse race, who is ahead, and by how many percentage points. This is a problem because reports of even tiny fluctuations in public opinion can have a major influence on the financial and practical support a candidate receives. It can even influence how people vote. Candidates employ some strategies to try to obtain favorable media coverage. Their staff often seek to isolate them from the press to avoid gaffes. They also stage media events to portray their candidates in the way they want them to be perceived. Spin control is a major part of the job of campaign staff. Candidates also appear on talk shows, comedy shows, and other non-news programs to present themselves in a more informal and appealing way to the voters. In the last half century, debates have become an expected part of presidential races, as well as senatorial and gubernatorial elections. 
Debates are used by voters not so much to learn candidates' positions on issues as to assess their suitability for office. So how have the rules and format for presidential debates changed since the first televised debates between Nixon and Kennedy back in 1960? Presidential debates have come a long way since then, a long way since an ill at ease Richard M. Nixon was visually bested by John F. Kennedy in the first set of televised debates. In 2012, President Barack Obama sparred with Governor Mitt Romney in a series of three debates, including one focusing on domestic policy, which is shown in the picture here. New media have revolutionized political campaigns, particularly the way in which information is disseminated and spread and the gathering of data. Candidates can use digital media to respond quickly to breaking news, scandals, or other issues quickly and flexibly. Over the last 20 years, the Internet has become a vital tool used by virtually all candidates for public office. Social media is increasingly important in reaching different demographic groups and targeting them. One use of new technology that has not proved popular with voters is the use of the robocall. Such recorded phone calls are frequently used to spread false information about opponents. Candidates employ several different types of advertisements in their arsenal of campaign strategies. Positive ads stress the candidate's qualifications, while negative ads focus on attacking the opponent's qualifications, character, or policy views. Contrast ads compare the candidates, with an obvious bias for the candidate sponsoring the ad. Inoculation ads attempt to anticipate attacks and deflect them. When the incumbent president is running for re-election, as Barack Obama did in 2012, the outcome is partly a referendum on his performance of the past four years. This was the case in the 2012 presidential election, which is the subject of this final section of the chapter. In 2012, President Obama did not face any challengers for the Democratic nomination, but Republican candidate Mitt Romney competed against a large field to secure the Republican nomination. His record as a moderate, as governor of Massachusetts, and his Mormon faith both worked against him with conservative Republican primary voters. The first three primaries featured three different winners, so his victory was far from assured in the early stages of the primary season. But after Super Tuesday in March, only Rick Santorum remained as a serious challenger, and Romney won sufficient states by early April that it became clear he was going to win the nomination. Reflecting the diversity of the Republican field, many candidates appeared to be the flavor of the week during the nomination campaign. From November 2011 to April 2012, however, three candidates separated themselves from the field, Mitt Romney, Newt Gingrich, and Rick Santorum. This figure tracks the rise and fall of each candidate's popularity as well as that of several other Republican candidates. Both Obama and Romney used the interim months before their party conventions to fundraise. Obama received a boost to his campaign when the individual mandate of the Obamacare legislation was upheld by the Supreme Court as constitutional. But he also committed a major gaffe that summer which would haunt him for the rest of his campaign. In referring to the benefits that business owners received from the government, he said, you didn't build that. The phrase was, of course, taken out of context and used against him by Republicans for the remainder of the race. Romney committed a few minor verbal gaffes of his own, but they did not have the impact of, you didn't build that. In August, Romney announced that his running mate would be 42-year-old Representative Paul Ryan, Wisconsin, the man who is currently the Speaker of the House of Representatives. This pick was calculated to bolster Romney's credentials with conservatives, and it worked. Governor Romney chose Representative Paul Ryan, who at the time was chairman of the House Budget Committee, because he believed Ryan would help to shore up support with the conservative base. He also hoped that Ryan would help to deliver votes in his home state of Wisconsin, which many commentators viewed as a swing state. The Republican National Convention got off to a windy start as Hurricane Isaac blew through Tampa, Florida. After the brief weather delay, Ann Romney, the wife of Mitt Romney, 
gave a speech calculated to make her husband appeal to women voters. Paul Ryan's acceptance speech was criticized for numerous factual errors. The convention concluded with Romney's acceptance speech, which was viewed by an estimated 30.3 million people. The Democratic National Convention was held in Charlotte, North Carolina. A minor controversy erupted on opening day about the absence of God from the party platform. This oversight was remedied, and the program began with a speech from First Lady Michelle Obama. Candidates' wives give speeches to humanize the candidates and get the public to warm up to them, not to talk about their policy views. Bill Clinton gave a well-received speech formally nominating President Obama for re-election, but the candidate's acceptance speech had to be moved indoors due to rain, reducing the live audience from 72,000 to about 20,000. About 35.7 million people are thought to have viewed Obama and Vice President Biden speak. The economy dominated the general election campaign. Critics charged that Obama could no longer blame Bush for the stagnant economy and high unemployment because he had now had four years to fix it. The fatal attack on the U.S. Embassy in Benghazi, Libya, on the anniversary of the 9-11 attacks was also extremely damaging to the Obama campaign. The candidates debated on live television three times. Romney won the first debate, which was seen by more than 67 million viewers. Obama's lackluster performance garnered much criticism and lowered his poll numbers. Obama stepped up his game in the second debate, watched by 66 million viewers. Both candidates were perceived as performing well, although the nod went to Obama this time. Obama also narrowly won the third debate, but fewer voters, viewers turned in, and it did not raise his poll numbers, leaving the race tight. 51 million viewers saw the vice presidential candidate's debate, a slim majority thought Vice President Biden won that debate. In the final days of the campaign, the swing states, such as Wisconsin, Florida, Ohio, New Hampshire, Virginia, and Colorado, were all too close to call. Hurricane Sandy caused the cancellation of several campaign events in the final week of the race. The storm caused over $50 billion in damage and provided opportunities for President Obama to appear in the news media, pledging relief to storm victims and viewing the damage. Bipartisan efforts to assist the beleaguered states also showed the president in a positive light. So how do candidates reach out to voters for support? Candidates hold large speeches, rallies, and events in an attempt to energize potential supporters. Here, President Obama speaks to a gathering in Madison, Wisconsin, in the weeks before the election. Election night was tense for supporters of both candidates, as the race was too close to call. The evening began to go badly for Romney when he lost his home state of Michigan. Obama ended up winning all of the key swing states. When all states' votes were tallied, President Obama received 332 electoral college votes, and challenger Romney received 206. Obama received 8 million fewer votes than in 2008, and Romney won two states that had voted for Obama in 2008. However, at the end of the night, President Obama was re-elected to a second term in office. The majority of candidate visits were concentrated on a small number of swing states that were viewed as up for grabs in the 2012 presidential election. During the campaign, President Obama visited the above 10 battleground states 131 times, and Mitt Romney visited them 179 times. The remaining 40 states received Obama only 81 times, and Romney only 106 times. So as you can see, campaigns, especially presidential campaigns, play a significant role in the political process. So as we conclude this chapter, these are some questions that you should be able to discuss and provide some deep and detailed answers to. Why does money play such a large role in political campaigns? Do you think the role of money in elections should be limited? Many people criticize the role of money because they say when money is given to campaigns, especially in large sums, the donor expects something in return and that is influence and access to rulemaking and lawmaking after the election. 
that can give the, wealth, the super wealthy in this country significant influence and control over our political system and the laws and rules we live by. So many people think the role of money in elections should be limited. What do you think? If you do think it should be limited, how would you propose to do this without violating free speech rights as the Supreme Court in both Buckley, Buckley v. Vallejo in 1976 and Citizens United v. FEC in 2010 has equated spending money on a campaign with free speech rights that are guaranteed in the First Amendment. This concludes Chapter 13, our look at the campaign process.